Hi everyone, my name is Leanne and today I'm going to be wrapping up the books that I read in November and December. So I'm going to be bringing you little mini reviews of the books that I read in both of those months. I have combined November and December for like two reasons. One, I read hardly anything in November. I read two books, which is like very little for me. And I didn't feel like it was worth doing a wrap up for just two books. From December, I also have six Christmassy books to talk to you about and two that are like not exclusively Christmassy, but they are festive. And we are past Christmas now. So I'm going to talk about those Christmassy books towards the end of the video. We're going to get increasingly Christmassy. So if you feel like you don't want more Christmas, you can tap out. Across November and December, I read three nonfiction books. I'm going to talk about those first. Just Saying by Mallory Blackman is her memoir that looks at events from her childhood up through her adulthood, her education, her early career, which was not in writing, and then her beginning, her writing journey, her writing career, her being the children's laureate. What I thought was really unique and great about this memoir was that Mallory didn't just go chronologically through the events of her childhood up to adulthood up to now etc it was kind of more grouped together thematically which I thought was a really great way of telling us her life story and I've read a lot of Mallory Blackman books before she's probably most well known for the Knots and Crosses series which I loved but I didn't know too much about her actual life I didn't know too much about her upbringing I found it particularly fascinating to hear her talk about her deciding to leave like a corporate world and be beginning her journey with writing. I also really appreciated her sharing so much of her experiences of sickle cell disease, of pregnancy, of miscarriage, of motherhood. I thought it was really touching that she shared those experiences. Throughout the memoir there is also this recurring persistence of the importance of children being able to see themselves in the media and particularly the books that they are consuming and how important that is to Mallory and I thought that was fantastic. She came across so brilliantly in this book. I mean it just reasserted to me that I think she's a fantastic person, someone that I really admire. But having read this memoir now I realise there are so many more reasons to admire her than I had initially realized. I also read Fix the System, Not the Women by Laura Bates. So Laura Bates is a very well-known kind of feminism, anti-sexism campaigner. She's recently written a fantasy novel for young adults, but for a greater length of time, she has been known for her nonfiction writing, which is often centered around themes of like anti-sexism and women's experiences. And this collection of commentary is based around this idea that we often instruct women how to avoid bad things happening to them rather than fixing the system that allows people to perpetuate the bad things that happen to women. For example, if you are a woman walking home at night, you are often given lots of advice of things you should do to protect yourself on that journey from, for example, your bus stop to your house. And that puts the responsibility on women's shoulders to protect themselves rather than fixing the system that makes people want to do bad things to women and facilitates a world that they feel like they can get away with it and often do. This book is very thoroughly detailed but also not overly complex in how it explains things to you as the reader. It doesn't make things kind of overly academic and Laura has a fantastic way of writing that blends the seriousness of what she's talking about but also the gentle humor that she includes and the kind of conversational anecdotal way that she can tell you quite detailed information. The book looks at politics, it looks at policing, it looks at the justice system and this is actually one that I would really recommend men to read so they can fully kind of begin to understand the amount of things that women are already doing to protect themselves <laughs> and that the onus should not be on women. I also read Lost in Work Escaping Capitalism by Amelia Horgan. This is a book that basically kind of dissects working. It looks at how the pressure to work and have a job that is perceived as being you know successful or worthy can be really damaging to people and it also looks at the kind of service jobs that are often really negative environments for people to be working in, where the workers are really mistreated, they are not paid enough, the actual work is damaging. It looks at how a lack of control in the workplace can also make people miserable. <laughs> I think I'm going to be reading quite a few more books on our relationships with our careers and work as I kind of 
figure out a lot of things to do with my own relationship with careers and work. I thought this was a great place for me to start. It didn't hit on exactly the kind of things that I'm looking for in that explorative journey. And I really like the series that this is from. So this is from Pluto Press's Outspoken series, which I always find a really great way to start exploring more about a topic because it is very detailed, very thoroughly researched is somewhat academic but is also really quite accessible. I've read a lot of books from this series before and I will certainly be reading more after this one. Okay we're gonna do some fiction for grown-ups now. I read The Situationship by Taylor Dior Rumble. So our main character in this book is Tia who is a young woman navigating all of the things that come with navigating life as a young woman kind of careers, friendships, relationships or in her set of circumstances, the situation ship. The love of her life returns home with a new girlfriend. And Tia has been in this, as the title says, kind of situation ship with this guy for a long time. And she's just very confused by the fact that he has come back with a girlfriend. So she decides that it is time that she put herself back out there. But apps are awful. <laughs> she doesn't feel like she's going to meet anyone in real life, but she is really surprised when on one of the dating apps she connects with a photographer named Nate and they start going on dates. They actually start working together in a certain capacity and Tia kind of assumes they're on the same page about where this connection is headed. This book really takes a look at modern dating and all the kind of nuances in that and like the experiences that so many people have gone through with modern dating. I think particularly like modern dating in London, of people not being quite honest about how they are feeling, about people treating each other as if they are dispensable, the way we hyper fixate on people's social media and how long it takes them to text back and how it often feels like you're just trying to pretend you don't care at all to be super chilled. For me, it didn't really dig into that topic, which is the title topic of the novel. It didn't dig into that as much as I would have liked it to. Maybe that's just from the perspective of someone who, prior to being in my committed, loving, beautiful relationship that I'm in now, had a lot of like situationships and experienced a lot of the confusions of dating when people weren't like putting their cards on the table. Like I have a lot of experience in that. So I felt like this novel could have gone so much further in exploring it. Like Tia is only experienced in really like, I think the tip of the iceberg when it comes to that topic. And I think her naivety was something that I kind of struggled with in this book, but equally like this is one of her earliest experiences of dealing with situationships and navigating dating. And it makes sense that she was approaching some situations kind of naively. I do think this was a good book. I would be keen to read more from this author, but in terms of really digging into the titular subject of the book, I just felt like it could have gone further. I also read So Lucky by Dawn O'Porter. I'm honestly not sure what I thought of this book. <laughs> so this novel takes a look at the lives of three different women. Now, when I went into this book, I had wrongly assumed that these women were all friends. Their lives are connected and they become more connected as we progress through the novel. And one of the things I really enjoyed about the book was being able to kind of spot how their lives were eventually going to intersect. But at the beginning of the book, like they're not friends, they don't know each other. So we have Ruby, who is a mother to a young girl. I think she's like a toddler. Ruby is a photographer that spends her life kind of retouching photographs of other people. So that gives her quite a complicated relationship with beauty and kind of body image and that kind of thing. And that complication is increased even further because of her relationship with her own body. So she has a very hairy body, like not just on the places that you might assume a woman would have hair on her body, like arms, legs. The way she describes herself is that she is really covered in hair. So she spends a lot of time trying to cover that up, you know, literally so people can't see it, but also keeping it a secret from the people in her life, the people that she interacts with. She doesn't want anyone to know. She feels a lot of body shame around it. And that's something that I never really read about before. I thought it was really interesting to hear about the lengths that she was going to to conceal this thing about herself. We also have Beth who is a new mother. She is like an events wedding planner person. She is a new mother. She's returned to work so she's grappling with all of the things around that. It's taking a strain on her relationship with her husband which 
to everyone externally, it seems like they are the perfect happy couple, but that is not the case. Beth is also particularly concerned about their sex life or lack thereof, and also the complicated role that her mother-in-law is playing in their family unit. And then we have Lauren, who is a famous kind of like celebrity slash influencer. She is engaged to be married to someone very wealthy. A lot of her life is spent kind of sharing stuff on Instagram, doing paid content for Instagram. But as is often the case with people that live lives like that, a lot of it is kind of a misrepresentation of who they actually are and whether or not they are actually happy and fulfilled. I do think I enjoyed this book and I do think it delved into experiences that I haven't read about before, but I think it almost felt like there was three different novels in here because I feel like there was so much to each of these women's lives individually that we could have had a whole novel about each of them. And I do love books that are about connections between women where we do have multiple women's perspectives, but I just feel like there was a lot of topics going on in this book. And ultimately it is about this idea of like women comparing their lives to one another and how that is pointless because you don't know the full extent of someone's life. You don't know what's really going on. Your perception of their life may not be accurate. Like that was the central idea at the heart of this novel. But I do think I just wanted to read about each of these women individually. There was one element of this book as well that I just, it felt like a bit too convenient and like not realistic, which involves how two of the women are connected through one of the male characters. And that just felt like kind of unnecessary and unbelievable to me. I have read books from Donna Porter before and have really loved them. And as I said, I did really enjoy this one. It maybe just felt like it was pulling in a few too many directions and trying to cover a few too many topics. I really want to read her newer book, The Cat Lady, because I've heard lots of good things about that one. My romance reads that I properly read over like Christmas. So when I was traveling home on Christmas Eve, I was reading it on Christmas day, was Kiss Her Once For Me by Alison Cochran. So I loved the concept of this book. This is about a woman who meets another woman in a bookshop and they have this amazing connection. They spend this day together, they spend the night together. But the next morning, our main character Ellie is left really disappointed. She feels betrayed by the woman that she met at the bookshop the day previously. And they have had no contact since that time that they, spent a beautiful day and night together. Since then, a lot of things have gone wrong in Ellie's life. She has lost her job. She's now working in a cafe. She's generally just feeling a little bit lost in life. And then one night, her landlord at this cafe drunkenly proposes, quite literally, that they have a marriage of convenience. So he's set to inherit a bunch of money from his granddad, like he is super rich and he's set to inherit even more money from his granddad, but there is a stipulation that he has to be married before he gets this inheritance. So he's suggesting that if Ellie like fake marries him, like they will legitimately get married, but they're not in a relationship, he will give her a cut of this inheritance. And that's like a life-changing amount of money for Ellie. So she decides to go along with it. They decide that they should spend Christmas with his family. So they like buy into this fomance. Ellie arrives for Christmas. She is getting along with the family so well until his sister shows up. And it turns out his sister is the girl that she spent the day with last Christmas. So obviously that's like super complicated. <laughs> These women are like super into each other, super attracted to each other. But Ellie has to keep up the lie that she legitimately wants to marry this girl's brother, even though she has so many feelings for this girl, but also she has so much resentment for this girl because of what we eventually find out happened. I thought this book was fun. I thought it had lots of great representation in it in terms of kind of like the spectrum of sexualities and people like discussing their sexualities. I thought that was done brilliantly. I thought the connection between our two fem female leads was great. Like their chemistry was super believable to me. The plot was like a little bit ridiculous and obviously that plot set up I was super into for its ridiculousness. But as we progress through the book and it's just like continuous miscommunication, lack of communication, it did become like a bit silly. A lot of the writing became a little bit repetitive. Like there was one line that really stood out to me, which was something like, it's the hope that kills me. And it must have been used like six times. Like it became really jarring. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but like it, it was such a specific phrase that 
it was jarring to me. I had a lot of fun with this book. I don't think it's the best kind of written rom-com that I've ever read, but I really enjoyed it. I would read more from this author. I loved how festive it felt. I had a great time. Another festive romance I read was Only for the Holidays by Abiola Bello. This is a young adult romance that is published by the place that I work. So this is a romance between Tia and Quincy. Tia is a proper like city girl, loves the city. So when she is told that they are gonna spend Christmas down in the countryside, she is devastated. She does not want to do this, especially because she is meant to be going to her boyfriend. I say boyfriends because he said to her that he would like to have a break from the relationship, but she really wants to go to his birthday party that she has organized. She doesn't understand what he means by them going on a break. She is giving him way too much benefit of the doubt. But yeah, she just really doesn't want to go down the countryside to spend time in this like beautiful countryside place. But she ends up having a bit more fun there than she anticipated, particularly because of a boy named Quincy who helps run this farm with his family and his family have been chosen to host the winter ball, which is like a really big deal in this town. It's like their big like Christmas festive winter event. And it's also the first time that a black family have ever hosted the event. So his family are definitely like feeling the pressure. Initially, Tia and Quincy really don't see eye to eye, but they come up with this scheme where they have a fake dating romance. So for the winter ball, it is expected that you have a date. Quincy does not have a date. And also he's recently gone through a breakup. And he said to everyone like, oh yeah, I've got a date for the ball, don't worry. And he doesn't. So that's where Tia comes in. And of course, over the time of them having this fake romance, they begin to develop real feelings for each other. And their chemistry felt so authentic to me. The way Abiola Bello writes chemistry is just, mwah, it's so good. And I also think it is so difficult to craft teenagers authentically. And she does that brilliantly. I also thought it was so funny how Tia like struggles in the countryside. Like, I felt like I could relate to that. I really loved this. I would highly recommend this for teenage readers and adult readers alike. It totally felt like this could be like a Netflix rom-com. Okay, we are very much in the Christmassy books now. So I read Diary of a Christmas Elf, Secrets of a Christmas Elf and Adventures of a Christmas Elf all by Ben Miller. And these are all published by the place that I work. So I read these all in one very cozy reading evening and it was perfect in the lead up to Christmas. They are told in diary entry form, which makes them super quick reads. Diary of a Christmas elf is from the perspective of Tog, who is of course a Christmas elf. Secrets of a Christmas elf, we get the perspective of Holly, who is Santa Claus's daughter. And in Adventures of a Christmas elf, we get both of their perspectives. And they're just kind of Christmassy festive adventures set around Santa's workshop. They're really, really funny. They're silly. They're super Christmassy, super festive. I won't spend too much longer talking about these because like they are very much Christmas books and we are now in January. But these were exactly like the reading experience that I wanted from them. They were just really fun, really festive. Finally, I have three books of poetry. So I read And So This Is Christmas by Brian Bilston. So Brian Bilston is kind of known as like the poet laureate of Twitter. Like he writes a lot of very kind of short, snappy, but also very humorous poetry. And this is a collection of poems that are Christmas themed. So some of them are new from Brian Bilston, but some of them have been published in various places previously. And they've just been collected in this one Christmas edition. This was another super cozy, quick, festive reading experience for me. I really enjoy Brian Bilson's slightly kind of um, dry wit. And I also really love how he plays with sound effect and plays with form in his poetry as well. It's just really entertaining poetry. I don't think you need to spend like too long thinking complexly about his poetry. It's very accessible and straightforward. And the way he touches on serious topics when he does touch on them is done with this real lightness. I also read Advent Street and Christmas Eve at the Moon Underwater, both by Carol Ann Duffy. So every year, Carol Ann Duffy brings out one of these really little Christmas poems that are beautifully illustrated by a different illustrator every year. I have so many of these now. I have quite a stack of them. And these were the last two that I needed to get. So the one that came out last year and the one that came out this year. I love Carol Ann Duffy's poetry. I love how she plays with sound effect. And I think how she plays with sound in these two in particular, I was so... Oh, it was just so, I was so impressed. It was one of those times where like a rhyming scheme just makes you feel, oh, so good inside. The premise of this one is taking a look at a bunch of different houses on this street. It's kind of peeking in the window of these houses in the run up to Christmas. And then this one has a lot of animals that are gathering in a pub on Christmas Eve. And that was just such a fun topic as well. I just love 
how they've taken these like really unique ideas and made them so playful and so beautiful both in the language and in the illustration. Super quick reading experience as a lot of these Christmas books were but so thoroughly enjoyable and I would like to next Christmas revisit all of these little poems by Carol Ann Duffy. I could do like a like a 12 days of Christmas thing with them, I think. So that is it. They are all the books that I read in November and December. Do leave me a comment down below and let me know what you've thought of them. If you also read any of these or let me know what the best book you read over the Christmas was or the winter break. I do have various videos coming up where I will be wrapping up kind of like my whole reading year. So like my top books of 2023. I might do some stats videos as well. If you want to keep up with my reading in between booktube videos, do follow my bookstagram account which is linked down below in the description and if you want to let me know you're here but you don't have anything in particular to say just leave me like the stack of books emoji that is it for me today i hope you're doing well and i will speak to you in my next video